part is being uh, organized by an initiative of a few uh, professors and graduate students here on campus called Christian Leadership Initiative. We are exploring the nexus of faith and science here on, on campus through various uh, activities and running seminars and uh, talks like this one. It's also being co-sponsored basically by the Simon Fraser uh, Student Society. Uh, so, uh, let me introduce our speaker and it is my very great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. David Livingston. It's an especially a great pleasure because uh, this is his second attempt, successful attempt the first time, which was uh, kind of school, not really a serious medical uh, uh, emergency office uh, dear wife. Uh, who isn't uh, doing uh, much better now. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. David Livingston is a professor of geography and intellectual history at Queen's University in Belfast. He, uh, well, we could uh, have a very lengthy uh, uh, description of his credentials. He has published many, many journal uh, papers, books, uh, such as Adam's Ancestors, Race, Religion, and the politics of uh, human origins and as one of the signs of his uh, high uh, respect and, and standing in the scientific community. He was uh, appointed officer of the Order of the British Empire in 2002 for his contributions to geography and history. Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for uh, coming uh, to speak here. Uh, as if we are looking uh, forward uh, to the talk. <clears throat> well, thank you for the uh, invitation to be, uh, to be here, and can I apologize again for having to uh, cancel at very short notice this uh, lecture I was to give last week. My wife was taken pretty seriously ill on the day after we arrived, and she's been in hospital now, I think, 17 days, so I've had a rather longer stay in Vancouver, honestly, than even I would have liked. Really. Uh, but, but she seems to be, uh, she seems to be on the mend, and we're hopeful that she'll be perhaps out of hospital by the weekend, and we might be back on our way home by next week. At least that's our, that's our, our hope. Um, science and religion plays politics and poetics. This is a topic I've been thinking on for a while because I've been doing some research on the relationship between science and religion, um, in, particularly in the context of the Darwinian debates. And so what I want to do um, today is to begin with some contemporary uh, stories, if you like, some contemporary debates that are going on, and I'll try to analyze in these uh, the rhetoric that has been going on in some of these uh, debates, and then to argue that um, much of the noise that we see it really is obscuring what I think are some of the debates that really are going on and what looks like a science-religion dispute or a science-religion fracas, but turns out often to be about something else. And I want to illustrate then the role of what I'm calling here place, politics, poetics. I mean by that vocation, I mean by that cultural politics, I mean by poetics really the rhetoric that uh, goes on around these, uh, some of these debates. And I want to try to show how in different, in different settings, in different venues, there are very different relations between scientific commitments and those of religious faith. Even if you follow a single faith community through different places, you're going to see very different ways in which these debates are, are organized. So let me begin with what I'm calling a couple of cautionary tales. And I should ask, what time do I need to finish at? 3.20? Yes. Yeah. It's got to be 3.20. Oh. It's got to be. Okay, right. Well, I'll we'll stop talking at 3.20. <laughs> okay, uh, a couple of cautionary tales. Right, I want to begin with Jerry Fodor. Jerry Fodor is the state of New Jersey professor of philosophy at Rutgers University and has got a massive reputation as perhaps the world's leading philosopher of mind. He's also a self-declared secular humanist. Now my story begins when a few years ago he had a go at evolutionary psychology, querying 
the, the capacity of Darwinian adaptation to explain just about everything about us from, oh, I don't know, why we like music to why, and we want to have a department here, why we have modern management problems. Darwin can explain that. Apparently, uh, Fodor says, uh, we're told that we like music because singing together strengthened the bonds between us when we were hunter-gatherers. And apparently, we have management problems because our minds evolved to survive on the African plains two or three hundred thousand years ago. They didn't evolve to make us happy in modern-day Vancouver or modern-day Manhattan. Now, Fodor thinks these are entertaining accounts, but he thinks they're quite fictional. He describes them as just so stories. And along the way, he pauses to inspect the whole idea of natural selection and adaptation as the mechanism of evolutionary change. He is querying the notion that nature really can select for particular traits and thinks that that concept is deeply problematic. Now, it wasn't too long after Fodor made these pronouncements before missiles were lobbing in. A skirmish was pretty quickly underway. All sorts of scribblers, um, historians, biologists, philosophers, even a musician, all of them felt the need to have a say in this debate. And of course, these included, understandably, some of those from the ranks of what he calls the High Darwinians. Uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, Phil Kitcher, Jerry Coyne. Dan Dennett, very eminent philosopher, wondered, now I use his words, what could have driven Fodor to hallucinate so wildly? Uh, the latter two, Coyne and Kitcher, found uh, all of Fodor's argument entirely, and I quote, incoherent. Now, that was pretty testy talk, I think. Testy to be sure. But it wasn't really what I would call open warfare of the fire at will variety that Fodor would later experience. That had to wait till 2010. Well, in February 2010, Fodor brought out a book with another cognitive scientist, uh, Massimo Piatelli Almarini, and he gave it a very daring title. What Darwin Got Wrong. Now, this book is a complex set of arguments. I'm not a philosopher, but I don't really think that I need to explain them in detail, save to say that he exploited an important philosophical distinction between what he called intentional and extensional propositions. But it was all to make this case that nature is incapable of selecting for particular traits in order to adapt organisms to their environment. In the last analysis, he feels that concept is empty. You see, to Fodor, nature, being the mindless kind of a thing that it is, can't really select anything. And can't select anything in anything like the way a breeder selects the particular chicks, for example, that are doing pigeon breeding, that the breeder wants to breed for a particular trade. Why? Pigeon fanciers have minds. But, well, nature doesn't. And so we felt that a lot of the traditional selectionist stories in biological history were really post hoc historical narratives, not really law-like scientific explanations. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. It's a complex book, and there's a lot of science in it with uh, his co-author, the expanded biological dimensions of the subject. But that's not what I'm after here. Let's be clear about a couple of things. Jerry Fodor has no problem at all with evolution. What's more, he assumes, and I quote him, that evolution is a mechanical process through and through. He's just sure that natural selection can't be the mechanism of adaptive evolution that the High Darwinians claim that it is. And I tell you, judging by the reviews, you would think the sky had fallen in. Richard Lewont, a very eminent biologist, put it this way. <coughs> the circulation of proof copy of the book, he says, has resulted in a volume of critical comment from biologists and philosophers that has not been seen since 1859. 1859 was the year the Origin of Species was published. He goes on. No week has passed that a manuscript expressing outrage or bewilderment 
from a biologist or a philosopher of science, no such week has passed that something from them has not arrived on my desk or on my desktop. Now, I mentioned that Jerry Fodor has no religious axe to grind. He and his co-authors describe themselves as, and I quote, card-carrying, signed up, died in the wool, no holds barred atheists. That looks pretty clear. But you wouldn't think it from the reviews. Michael Roos, for example, had this to say, writing in the Boston Globe. At the beginning of the book, he says, these authors proudly claim to be atheists. Perhaps so. But my suspicion is that like those scorned Christians, they just can't stomach the idea that humans might just be organisms no better than the rest of the living world. He goes on, we've got to be special, superior to other denizens of planet Earth. Christians, he says, are open in their beliefs that humans are special, and explaining them lies beyond the scope of science. I just wish that our authors were a little more open that this is their view too. Well, naturally enough, Fodor didn't take too kindly to that. And in reply, he wrote, none of that is even remotely our view, he observed. There's not a scintilla of text in our book to support the accusation of creeping theism. Now, for all that, review after review of this book has cast this analysis into the science-religion feud or quagmire one way or another. Bob Richard says, this book orchestrates a medley of contradictions that can only delight the ears of creationists and can only delight the ears of proponents of intelligent design. In fact, in his review, it led into a final salvo where he compared them to taking a cautionary parable from the debate between Wilberforce and Huxley in 1861, 1860, after the publication of The Origin of Species. This was the famous debate where Huxley is supposed to have said to Wilberforce that, I quote, I would rather have a monkey as an ancestor than be connected with a man like a bishop who used great gifts to obscure the truth. You see, by finishing with that rhetorical flourish, he's throwing the whole thing into the cauldron of science-religion relations, though it doesn't belong there. Um, Time and time again, critics have had nasty things now to say about the book. Despite his protest protestations to the contrary, Daniel Dennett describes both of these authors as mind creationists. <clears throat> Another reviewer, John Dupre, says that this book has been and will continue to be picked up by the fundamentalist enemies of science. <clears throat> Others have said, one reviewer in Nature, that the book is sterile and wrong-headed. Another one describes it as willfully ignorant, simply silly. Douglas Futiuma, uh, writing in the magazine Science, describes the authors as two critics without a clue. Neil Spurway claimed that these authors are not just arrogant, and they're not just obfuscating, they're dangerous. No, that's what I mean by poetics. It's the rhetoric here that attracts my interest. I don't care whether voters right or wrong. I went to see him in New York last year and had a nice conversation with him and so on, but that's not the point. The point is the context within into which this is always being, always being forced. Now this looks to me like pretty intemperate talk, and it's all the more surprising because Richard Lewontin, who was the Harvard geneticist who wrote the paper that indeed Fodor uses a good deal in his analysis, and which everybody says he gets wrong. Richard Lewontin, in his review, of, in the New York Review of Books, says, I think it would be wiser not to stop talking about nature selecting for. He goes on. Biologists should stop referring to natural selection, and instead talk about differential rates of survival and reproduction. For myself, I'm pretty sure that Fodor would welcome that. What's noticeable here is that there's an absence of vitriol and there's an absence of spleen venting that it seems to me are only too discernible elsewhere. And I suppose my second cautionary tale. Mistaken targets, misconstrued intentions, misplaced scorn are definitely sure signs of a culture war. My good friend, Keith Bennett, who works in my own department, <coughs> 
and received a few years ago a Royal Society Merit Award, Wilson Merit Award for his work, he discovered something similar. His experience, I think, uncovers further dimensions of this sci these science wars that I'm talking about. In 2010, uh, Keith was invited by the new scientist to publish a keynote lecture that he'd given at the International Paleontological Congress in Imperial College London on a particular summer. The other keynote speaker was none other than the distinguished scientist Niles Eldridge. The piece made the front cover of the magazine. Here it is. Now this presented evidence that Bennett had gathered over many years to assess the role of adaptation to environment in evolutionary history. This is what he observes. Major climatic events, such as ice ages, ought to leave their imprint on life as species that adapt to new conditions. But he asked, was that truly the case? Bennett didn't think so. His conclusion was that pan-adaptationism may not turn out indeed to be the major driver of evolutionary change that had routinely been assumed. He put it this way, and I quote him, the connection between environmental change and evolutionary change is weak, which is not what might be expected from Darwin's hypothesis. In his place, he proposed a non-linear uh, theory of what he calls using chaotic dynamics of the relationship between genotype and phenotype to come up with this notion of fractal evolution. I have no idea what it means, and neither do I care. What I'm interested in is the rhetoric. From the gloves, you could be forgiven for thinking that the Inquisition was gearing up again. Jerry Coyne, distinguished biologist, verged on the apoplectic. A sample of his vocabulary will be enough to give you a rough sense of his tone in his review of what Bennett had to say. It's stupid, thoughtless, ignorant, hogwash. The author's a moron. The article was drivel. The whole idea was ludicrous. As for Bennett's Royal Society Wilson Merit Award, that only induced Jerry Coyne, and I quote him, to weep for the Royal Society, which seems to have fallen in hard times. <laughs> Soon the blog that Jerry Coyne himself runs on his website, Why Evolution is True, was mainlining what I would call vitriol. On the very day he posted his attack, 42 comments were logged. <coughs> One thought Bennett's piece was, quote, appalling, and worry, and note again this, it could be misinterpreted in the wrong corner. I guess he's suggesting creationists might use this. Another found it sad and pathetic. Yet another speculated that Bennett has been bitten by a postmodernist, and then warned those bites can get infected. The list could go on, ignorant, giving fuel to creationists, completely misguided. A day or two later, Coyne gave his readers another fix under the title, New Scientist Defends Bad Science. Sixty comments followed, another adrenaline rush of scorn. Many complained about the evils of science journalism. Some claimed, missing the irony that blogs themselves are not subject to peer review, many of them said Bennett's ideas wouldn't get a hearing quote in a real science journal that uses proper expert evaluation. Now to get some perspective on the rhetoric that's going on here, let me just say two things. The first one is this. Graham Lawton, the commissioning editor of the journal, contacted Jerry Coyne and wrote him the following comment. If Keith Bennett is so helplessly wrong, wrong, hopelessly wrong, why was he ever invited to give that keynote alongside Nas Elbridge? Why did this symposium even take place? He goes on. Bennett was not the only one to question the primacy of natural selection in macroevolution. Why does the Royal Society support his work? I was at Bennett's talk. The room was full of learned and eminent people. He took a few questions, but there were no halls of protest like yours. He concludes, what am I to make of this? The second observation in the light of all those accusations about peer review and not being properly uh, peer assessed and so on, it's worth remarking that Bennett had presented similar arguments at the Royal Society itself a couple of years earlier. 
and he actually had them published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which I guess is a fairly eminent scientific journal. Here, Bennett had laid out evidence for his conviction that species persisted pretty unchanged over multiple glacial interglacial oscillations, and therefore that stasis exists despite environmental change. This led him to conclude, and I quote him there in the page of the Royal Society, that it could well be the crucial insight that evolution, after all, has really rather little to do with, with environmental change. Evolution might well be driven by mechanisms that are not adaptive, intrinsic mechanisms, something different. Commentators at the Royal Society, from what I can discern, displayed no contempt of the thought, but engaged calmly and constructively with the proposal. Now I've begun with these two cautionary tales. I call them fresh dispatches from the trenches of the Darwin combat zone. And they introduce the three cuts that I think I want to make of this whole issue. Thinking about science and religion. Place, politics, poetics. By place, I'm referring to the different locations, physical locations and social locations, in which debates about science take place. Indeed, literally, the engagements over science and science and religion take place in these places. By politics, I have in mind the role of the political atmosphere, broadly construed, in which these discussions of one sort and another are enmeshed. And of course, probably I'm using it because it's you know, ornamental and alliterative, I use poetics here, as I say, to refer to what I'm referring to really as the rhetoric, the idiom within which many of these debates take place. Now, now let me illustrate this with the cases I've just mentioned. You can say some things at a professional meeting of paleontologists at Imperial College London, or at the Royal Society, and you don't dramatically raise anybody's temperature, whereas exactly the same arguments will cause screams of protest in some other public forum. This underscores the salience of location if we're trying to get a handle on debates over science and faith. So I think that this suggests that when we're thinking about these controversies, it's important to attend to the spaces, the locations, the venues within which these altercations take place. It's also pretty clear, too, that certain scientific issues, and I think Darwinism is one of them, are hugely freighted with cultural politics. Evolution has acquired a huge iconic status in today's latter-day culture wars. And it's come to embody political investments of many, many different kinds. And this reminds us that science and religion both operate in wider political arenas. And these shape debates in really distinctive and important ways. And then I would say that the unrestrained language of trashing, to which Fodor and Piatelli Palmarini have been treated, and then Jerry Coyne's tirade and belittling Keith Bennett, these suggest to me that often rhetorical style counts for as much as cool, calm reflection in scientific religious debates of, of many kinds. So, so I'm going to argue that, that we have to attend to the places, we have to attend to the politics, and we have to attend to the poetics if we're to make any inroads into trying to understand the complex relation, relations between scientific theory and religious belief in, in our own time. So let me begin a little bit on this uh, by what I'm going to call remapping this, this zone. And I think that the two contemporary examples that I've used surely illustrate the point that disputes over scientific claims have deeper cultural issues working under, underneath them. You know, um, uh, I think that, to be honest, to Fodor and Piatelli Palmarini, I think that their locators always allied them with causes that were far removed from their own interests. And I myself think that their arguments were very rarely addressed head on. And I think that we have to therefore try to look at these locations to make, make sense of why that happened. You see, Fodor thought the lines were drawn in different places, but commentators were drawing the lines along the old science-religion debate, as though that was really what was going on whereas it certainly, certainly wasn't. Now, in the light of this, let me just give you um, a couple of examples 
of ways in which we might, in a fertile way, redraw some of these points. I want to give you two recent, recent examples of what I think are imaginative and fertile ways of thinking about what we often consider um, a conflict between science and religion. And I want to take us outside uh, the West here uh, for one example to show how thinking about this as a conflict in a different context, a science-religion conflict, opens up new possibilities. Let's not worry about that. John William Draper in 1874 published a hugely important book called The History of the Conflict Between Science and Religion. Uh, it's still available in print and it portrays a story of uh, warfare, a story of struggle, a story of conflict between science and religion from the ancient world up to his day in the 19th century. Now, I read recently uh, one historian has worked on the way in which, in which this work was used outside the West, and in particular how it was used in Turkey. It was translated by an Ottoman Turkish scholar, literateur, publisher, novelist, Ahmed Midat, and the translation has been, uh, has been scrutinized by, uh, by one or two scholars. And what's very interesting here is the way in which, in that context, in an Islamic context, the way in which Midat stage managed uh, Draper's book for political purposes in Turkey and in the Middle East. The book was about a conflict between science and religion, but Midat stage managed it in such a way to make it, in his translation and with his commentaries, a contribution to the clash not between science and religion, but between religion and religion. A conflict between Islam and Christianity. And he did this by drawing attention to hints in Draper's text of a more positive attitude amongst Muslim writers to science than amongst Christian writers. In other words, he used it to develop an apologia for Islam's greater compatibility with science than Christianity had. So how did he do this? He emphasized those places where Draper, uh, for example, emphasized and praised the contributions of the so-called Saracens, the way in which he used sci the scientific potential of Islamic philosophy particularly Islamic fatalism, the way in which he retrieved the writings and insights of the medieval uh, philosopher Averroes, in these ways, as the scholar comments, Midat used Draper to exonerate Islam and at the same time to confirm, a, and I quote him, a conflict between Christianity and science, thus providing Ottoman Muslims with a weapon against imperialism and the missionaries. You see what the, what's happening here? A zone of conflict is being remapped in a new way, and it's opening up new questions about, in this case, the relations between East and West, Christianity and Islam, rather than just simply assuming the standard Christianity versus science kind of conflict. Let me give you a second example. Those who are guided by one-dimensional maps of science and religion and perpetual war typically miss the fertility of this question that was posed in a very recent issue of the journal Evolutionary Anthropology by a distinguished journalist with whom I've corresponded, a distinguished anthropologist with whom I've corresponded, John Marx. Why were the first anthropologists creationists? Now, I guess that's a question that's not often very, that's not very often asked. I thought it was an imaginative question, especially today as culture wars. Very imaginative question. Well, in this article, John Marx turns first to the great German anthropologist Rudolf Virchow. Now, Virchow was a famous opponent of the idea of human evolution. Now, instead of just assuming, in a Whiggish sort of way, foreclosure on this question, Marx begins with what, from a contemporary perspective, I think is a provocative question. Here's his provo provocation. In a dualistic framework now, that pits evolutionism against creationism, abstracted from time, culture, and nuance, one is tempted to see Verkov as a closed-minded representative of the old West. In short, to see him as an old fool. That was, he goes on, precisely how he was portrayed at the time by Ernst Haeckel, 
the leading spokesman for German Darwinism. But John Marsh doesn't want to take that judgment at face value. He thinks it's woefully shallow. Presumptions that Wechow's rejection of the fossil evidence from evolution, he says, presumptions, presumptions that that sprang from backward-looking creationism, fails to take into account the way in which certain strands of 19th century German creationism could spring from something other than mere stupidity, intellectual conservatism, or religiosity. In fact, Marx tells us, a creationist explanation of human origins was very widely adopted by early anthropologists. Why? They were appalled at Ernst Haeckel's ultra-Darwinism, which undermined the unity of the human race. Uh, in fact, Haeckel believed that there were different human species, not just different varieties, and that these were arranged in a hierarchical fashion. Naturally, that had pretty horrible moral connotations. Besides the moral objections John Marx points out, it eroded the very foundations on which anthropology as a science was erected. Because anthropology as a science was erected on the assumption of the unity of the human psyche. So he points out that you might, I suppose Gallison uses this term, you might find here a fertile trading zone between political ideology, moral philosophy, religious conviction, and, anthropology, and anthropological science. Now John Marx, of course, intends this story as a contemporary parable. He's talking about the 19th century, Rudolf Virchow and Ernst Haeckel, but he's really talking about our own day, because he concludes his article this way. In the midst of today's cultural wars, Marx insists, and I quote him, it's perfectly possible to reject the racism of Philippe Rushton or James Watson. It's possible to reject the evolutionary psychology of Steven Pinker or the fanaticism of Richard Dawkins and yet not be a creationist. Just a few weeks ago at the American Anthropological Association, he reiterated something of the same story. But he also went on to comment on the troubling inclination in current science projects to reduce all of us as humans to nothing but our ape ancestry. We're nothing but apes. He feels that's a mistake, and it's a mistake that's coming out of what he considers to be an ultra-Darwinism. He provocatively puts it this way. Here's John Marx beside Charles Darwin, his, his hero. I think that's perhaps in London, but he says, uh, that's the quote that I intended to use earlier on. This is what he's saying now. If ape ancestry makes you an ape, does slave ancestry make you a slave? Humans, he says, are not apes. Humans are ex-apes. I thought it was quite insightful. Now, I can tell you comparable stories from elsewhere complicating this simple conflict model. But what I want to do in the final part of this talk now for a few minutes or so is, is now to move on to two points. One is the need to put science in its place. And I suppose I'm cribbing here from a book I published a few years ago with that, with that very title. We don't think often of, of science as a located activity. We think of it as a transcendental, universally true set of objective propositions and so on. But I want to suggest to you that scientific theories do not diffuse evenly across the face of the earth. And I want to use Charles Darwin's theory as an illustration. I want to take two examples just to see how, Darwin, how Darwin's theory was encountered, how it was read, and what it was made to mean in two very different locations at the tail end of the 19th century. The first one is Charleston, South Carolina. And here is the Charleston Museum of Natural History, where a number of distinguished uh, uh, scientists, marine and invertebrate scientists and the like, particularly John McCready, were located. Now, these scientists opposed Charles Darwin's theory tooth and nail because they remained devotees of the famous Swiss and Harvard <coughs> paleontologist Louis Agassiz, their hero, Louis Agassiz. Louis Agassiz believed that life had been created in a number of different centers of creation across the globe. To Agassiz and to McCready and his colleagues, animals were created in and for the environments within which they were from. That was Charleston, uh, South Carolina. Here are some of the figures associated. 
Elsewhere, and I'll come to it in a minute, in New Zealand, there was no opposition scarcely discernible to Darwin's theory from the religious community or from elsewhere. Here, Darwin's theory was very widely welcomed, and very largely there were few debates. Now, why did these two places amongst the scientific community respond so differently to what Darwin had to say? For this reason. Amongst the Charleston naturalists, Darwin's ideas about human origins were profoundly troubling. They were troubling to McCrady, who, who was dedicated, of course, to the idea of racial superiority. He believed in different human races. He believed some were superior to others, and he believed some were inferior to others. Each race, he believed, had a separate point of origin, and any blurring of that transcendental individuality was biologically repugnant, but it was socially repugnant as well. McCready therefore repeatedly insisted that it was impossible to conceive that the black and white races could have come from the same origin. To him, Darwin's theory, insisting that all human races were descended from a single stock, was profoundly troubling because of its political implications. The whole scientific circle that rotated around the Charleston Museum, Holmes, Albrook, Gibbs, and so on. To them, Darwinism was subversive of the political ideology on which their science was based on and on which their society was based. To them, the laws of nature, as they understood them, could never be obliterated by those pesky northern abolitionists. Darwin's theory challenged the very foundations, as they understood it, of the social order. Now what I'm saying here is that as they read Darwin's theory, they read it through the lens of racial politics. They read it through the lens of post-bellum anxieties about the fragmentation of the southern culture. They read it through their attitudes towards the liberalizing politics of Reconstruction. Darwin was politically dangerous. And those were the meanings that were read in, and I think read into, the origin species. Let's turn to Wellington, New Zealand. Things here were stunningly different. Whereas McCrady in the American South read Darwinian evolution as subversive of racial hierarchy, here Darwin's theory was read as underwriting the runaway triumphs of white colonialism. Darwin is first discussed in Wellington at the Colonial Museum. And here, in 1868-69, the inhabitants are introduced to Darwin's theory of evolution. The speaker is, I'm sorry to say, an Irishman, a botanist and a lawyer and a politician called William Travers. As Travers expounded the theory of evolution for his audience, he discerned in it a theory with immediate implications for race history. It goes like this. Just as the European rat, honeybee, and other invader species had displaced native, native New Zealand uh, creatures, so, and I quote him, the vigorous races of Europe were wiping out the Maori. It was a law of nature. In the struggle for existence, he says, whenever a white race comes into contact with an indigenous dark race on ground suitable to the former, the latter must disappear in a few generations. This was a law of nature. Moreover, it was not to be lamented. The historical successes of European culture meant, and I quote him, that even the most sensitive philanthropist may learn to look with resignation, if not with complacency, on the extinction of a people which in the past had accomplished so imperfectly every object of man's being. He is now reading natural selection through the lens of race relations in New Zealand. And he's bringing to Darwin's text the long-standing colonial conviction that the Maori simply were fated for extinction by the laws of nature. So here's what I'm saying. The encounter with Darwin in the American South and the New Zealand was stunningly different. They read their politics into the text. In one case, they rejected it for racial reasons. In another, they embraced it for racial reasons. That's why we have to put scientific debates in the context of their time and place to make sense of what I've called putting science in its place. Now let me finish maybe a little more hastily than I should so I can finish up by 
If what I've been saying is true of science in general, it's all the more true for debates over science and religion. And I think that to understand debates over science and religion, I'm going to use, use a historical example, we need to attend to the places, the politics and the poetics of these, of these engagements. Let me illustrate this by just following for a few minutes one single religious community and look at how they encountered Darwin in different parts of the world. Now I'm going to begin with a Canadian example and in order, I'm taking my life in my hands of course, taking a Canadian example here, but because the tradition of Scots Presbyterian culture was so influential in early Canada, I'm going to take that as the example and look at how these Scots Presbyterians responded to Darwin in four different places very quickly as I conclude. And the first place I want to look at in Toronto was uh, Knox College, which was uh, a theological seminary that uh, the Scots Presbyterians had established for the training of their own, of their own minister. minister. Now it's quite interesting to notice that this, uh, th this college launched its own monthly journal in the year 1883. And it's quite interesting also to notice that the very first editorial manifesto referred to Darwinian evolution as a subject that demanded the attention of every reader of this journal. I'm interested in the rhetoric. What is interesting about this rhetoric in Canada was how ameliorative and welcoming of evolution this particular Scots Presbyterian community really was. Writers worked really hard to absorb the theory and they even went so far as to rethink aspects of their own religion in the light of Darwinian intervention. There is no acrimonious opposition. There are no literalistic readings of the Bible. There is no unyielding faith in a fixed creation. These are conspicuous only by their absence. Let me give you one example. An article called Biology and Theology in 1886 told the readers that the biologist uses this theory of evolution as a working hypothesis, exactly in the same way that the chemist uses his atomic theory. Another writer, William Hunter, it doesn't even shirk the implications of Darwinism for human descent in the 1880s. I quote him, Man is not less a work of art because he's gradually formed, he writes. Readers, he urged, shouldn't be alarmed to, uh, if we see, we should not be alarmed if we see in the lower animals manifestations of some of the higher emotions which were supposed to belong exclusively to man or to humans. In fact, there's good reason to suggest, and I haven't time, as time is pressing, to look at this in too much detail, but there's good reason to suggest that the theologians in Canada in general were more open to Darwin's theories than the scientists were. The scientists were, um, had grown up on a very solid uh, foundation of De Baconian inductivism, were deeply skeptical of speculation, whereas these theologians had been interested in looking at notions of progressive revelation and the unfolding of the Hebrew Bible and were much more open to an evolutionary account than many of the scientists were. Let me give you one example on an article entitled The Evolution of Scripture. This particular writer in 1895 describes the Hebrew Scriptures as a wonderful study in evolution which evolved and grew in connection with the history of our race. That story is remarkably different if you turn to precisely the same religious community in Colombia in the American South. Here, there was a controversy that blew up in 1886 where this man, Woodrow Wilson's uncle, James Woodrow, was dismissed from his post as a teacher in the seminary for giving this lecture entitled Evolution. Here he was attacked, I think, from what looks to be in the surface like narrowly scriptural uh, considerations. Uh, one of his opponents, Girardot, says that the conflict is between Dr. Woodrow's hypothesis and the Bible as our church interprets it, between this scientific view and, and it's interesting, this our Bible, the Bible as it is to us. I wonder what he really had in mind by that. Well, the story goes like this. These particular intellectual leaders of Southern Presbyterianism had read the Bible in a very literal way for one major reason. If you read it literally, and you read it literalistically, you could find slavery 
perfectly well justified in the pages of both the Old and the New Testament. They were used to justify the social order and the existence of slavery by being literal about the Old Testament and the New. They certainly did not want someone to come along and interpret parts of it metaphorically, poetically, or in any other way, because that would challenge the very social foundations upon which, even in the post-bellum period, their entire ideology had been constructed. They were therefore they were therefore allergic to someone like uh, like like uh, Woodrow, who was approaching texts in the Old Testament in a way that emphasised their metaphorical implications, their allegorical meanings, and things of that sort. I'm almost done. I'll just finish with Edinburgh, and I'll not turn to, to. I was going to say something about my home city of Belfast, but I see my time is almost gone. Let me just finish with the same community now in Edinburgh. And I'm focusing here at New College with uh, this particular individual, Robert Rainey, who was the principal of New College, who took up his position in October 1874. He was the newly appointed principal, and what did he take as the very first topic that he would discuss that year? Evolution of theology was the title of the inaugural address. To Rainey, evolution is just irrelevant to religion. He was remarkably casual about it. Even about the idea of human evolution, he goes on to say, the application of theories of evolution to the origin of man is a point regarding which the theologian may be perfectly at ease. There is scarcely a, a debate from the 1870s through in this particular tradition in Scotland, there seem to be almost no concerns over Darwinian biology. Many examples I could give you, Robert Flint, Henry Calderwood, and many others, have not spent the time. But I did ask myself, why was it that there was a feud, for example, in Belfast, my home city, why was there a feud in the American South, but there is no debate over this here? Here's another, I think, interesting contextual factor. Because they were facing, they were facing challenges of an altogether more profound sort. And the challenge that they were facing came from this man, William Robertson Smith, who was arguably Scot Scotland's greatest intellectual in the Victorian period. Smith was arraigned on a heresy charge in the 1880s, largely over his acceptance of German biblical criticism and his application of German methods to understanding the text of Scripture. He wrote on this for the Encyclopedia Britannica, and this led to a trial in which he was dismissed from his professorship for adopting critical methods. But Smith is also the modern founder of anthropology, having written an outstandingly imaginative work on the religion of the ancient Semites. What was challenging here was he urged that the, the early history of Christian Eucharist could be found in an early ceremonial meal practiced in ancient times where a human individual was, totem individual, was killed by the tribe and ritually eaten by them. This was suggesting that Eucharist might have had its roots in primitive cannibalism. Now Dan Dennett says that, da that Darwin's idea is a dangerous idea. I put it to you that for Scots thinkers in the 19th century, and Scots Presbyterians in particular, Darwin was tame compared with ritual cannibalism of the sort that Robertson Smith was discerning as the prehistory of his own religious tradition. In fact, that idea was picked up by no, one, uh, by no less an individual than, than Freud, who, who, who used it to very good effect in his development of the idea of the totem. But even he thought that Robertson Smith had gone a bit too far. He thought perhaps the original the original cannibalism was only a ritualized, not a real experience of cannibalism. Maybe there was too much sex and violence among the Scots, even for Sigmund Freud. Well, I was going to finish with an example from Belfast, but I think I've tested your patience long enough. Let me just conclude this way. In these different places, Toronto, Columbia, Edinburgh, I would have said Belfast, Darwin's talked about in different ways. There are different cultural politics different locations. I think if we don't attend to those contexts, we'll never get to grips with what Darwinism was taken to mean 
and how the encounter with evolution was negotiated even within a single religious community. Wider implications are surely to be drawn from those initial reflections that I gave on the more recent engagements we've had. Debates on science and debates on science and faith always needed to be located, physically, politically, and culturally. I think that if we continue to trade in the tired monochrome categories of conflict or even universal cooperation, I think that that's historically dishonest and I think it's socially irresponsible. But whether indeed attending to the subtleties of place, politics, and poetics, whether that has any chance of making a difference in the marketplace of contemporary cultural superficiality, I really don't know, and I will leave for you.